Welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Jules Steelman. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist and the president of the Human Growth Foundation. I'm very happy that you all have joined us today for the Human Growth Foundation webinar. We're very privileged today to have one of our other members of the Human Growth Foundation speak. Uh, Dr. Amrit Bangu um, is a pediatric endocrinologist and associate professor at the Children's um, Hospital of Orange County. Um, he's had a, a long um, career and a, a great deal of experience in pediatric endocrinology and is going to be speaking to us today about Noonan syndrome, looking at both the growth aspects as well as endocrine care. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bangu, for joining us today for this webinar. Um, thank you, Dr. Steelman. Uh, it's truly a privilege uh, for me to speak uh, for the Human Growth Foundation. Today, we're going to discuss about uh, the RAS map signaling pathway. And as an endocrinologist, we always are challenged to understand this pathway. So I hope I'll shed some light on it. Uh, we'll discuss uh, what are the different uh, genetic mutations in this pathway which affect growth? And what is the experience of growth hormone therapy with Newton syndrome and what we can learn from it? And if Newton syndrome affects any other endocrine uh, disorder or condition, what are they and uh, how we can, we can identify those with our patients? Uh, so a little bit of a historical context on Newton syndrome. Uh, it was actually in 1883 that Kobylinski uh, was the first one in Estonia to present in a publication a male who had a webbed neck, uh, but it was described as a wing-like extension of the neck. But it was not described as a syndrome, so it didn't pick up that name. And until 1963, when Dr. Noonan published uh, a report on a series of these patients, who she was seeing, uh, she's a pediatric, she was a pediatric cardiologist and she was seeing these patients for pulmonic valve stenosis. And she described the syndrome and uh, the name actually was officially coined in 1971. In 1994, Wenderberg uh, described uh, a method of classification according to major and minor criteria, which some of her still use uh, to diagnose Noonan syndrome. And 2001 was the first genetic link which was identified to be associated with Noonan syndrome. And that was in the PTPN11 gene mutation. We're gonna learn more about that today. And then 2007, FDA approved the use of growth hormone therapy in Noonan syndrome, uh, according to the doses uh, written over here. Uh, I don't think that it's been approved in Europe by the European agency, uh, but it's been uh, approved uh, in the US. And there's been more and more genes which have been discovered and linked. So the discovery of a Noonan syndrome still goes on. The, a little background on Noonan syndrome, the estimated incidence is about one in a thousand to one in 2000 life births. And these are estimated instant incidents because there is no population-based studies which is done in Newton syndrome. So it's kind of hard uh, to exactly know what the incidence is. There does not seem to be any gender uh, predisposition. Uh, in families who inherit it, it is autosomal dominant, which is seen in about half of the patients. And in the other half, it's uh, known to be associated with a de novo mutation, a new mutation in the family, in the person. Uh, there is a little bit predisposition towards maternal transmission, then paternal transmission is three, three is to one. The characteristic facial features in Noonan syndrome is a little bit different from the other syndrome is because these features, these facial features, they change with age. So I'm just gonna highlight few features for each age group. So in the newborn period, you you see a, a significant hypertilarism. You see a low downward sliding feeble fissures and a low set ears. In infancy, you have about the same changes along with low set ears. You see a low posterior hairline with nuchal folds. But what starts to develop in infancy is a prominent forehead along with the prominence of the eyes. And as the 
these children go through childhood, in the early childhood part of the growth, uh, they start to develop some coarse facial features. And you would have somebody who has like almost like an expressionless face uh, in the early childhood. So what is also interesting is they tend to develop prominence of the neck with the development of the trapezius muscle, which is seen in about 90% uh, of patients with Noonan syndrome. And as they go into adolescence, uh, things start to change more. You see more prominent development of the triangular faces. The anterior hairline becomes posterior. The eyes are not prominent anymore. You do have prominence of the trapezius muscle and the, the low set ears are also still present. So low set ears are constantly present through, through the age group. And even in adults, you have low set ears which are present. In adults, you see more wrinkling of the skin develops. You see the development of the nasal, uh, nasolabial folds are more prominent. Uh, and you see a little bit more prominent facial features in adults. So even today, the diagnosis of Noonan syndrome is primarily a clinical diagnosis. Uh, short stature is present in about 80%. So it's, it's, a, it's a cardinal feature of Noonan syndrome is short stature, which is present in about 80%. Cardiac defects are also predom uh, predominantly present in majority. And the, the most common one is the pulmonic valve stenosis with dysplastic leaflet. This is present in about 60%. Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or HOCAM is present in about 20%. ASD are in around another five to 10%. Chest deformities are also pretty common, uh, which includes affectus carinatum superiorly and then affect, affectus excavatum inferiorly in the chest. Hubertus valgus deformity is in about half. Typical facial features that we discussed would change with age, but they are present. And coagulation abnormalities are present in about 30 to 40%, depending on which uh, gene is mutated. Peripheral lymphedema is present in up, up to about 20%, patients with Noonan syndrome. And genetic mutations are listed over here, but they're only present in about 75% of the cases with Noonan syndrome. So you still need a clinical diagnosis and it's primarily a clinical diagnosis because these genes are still getting discovered and we don't know the whole uh, story yet. Uh, PTPN11, SOS1, RAF1, RIT1, KRAS, BRAF, CBL, and so on. These are the genes which are being involved in Noonan syndrome or Noonan-like syndrome. And they are an important part of which is called the RAP, RAS MAP kinase pathway. So I'm gonna spend two minutes discussing that. And as an endocrinologist, what we can learn from it. It's a very complex pathway, the RAP MAP kinase pathway. It is pretty much present in every human cell. There are four different MAP kinase pathways in humans. And the start, starting point of this pathway is the RAS protein, which is a, a GTPase enzyme. And you have a HRAS, KRAS, NRAS. The second step is RAF, which is also three different types of RAFs, leading to the third one, which is a MAP ERK kinase, or called MEK in short, and there's one and two. And then the final step, of these intracellular signaling pathway is ERK, which is in, important not only for cyto, uh, cytoplasmic protein, but also for nuclear protein production. Apart from this signal transduction pathway, uh, this is important, very important in fetal life for organ formation, organ differentiation. And even after birth, it is more important for growth and development of the child. Has important roles in the, the neuronal activity, the synaptic development. Uh, so that's why there is a neurological phenotype to the syndrome. And also 
uh, many other growth factors and hormones to work through it. So that's where we come in as endocrinologists is because of the involvement of growth factors and hormones in this pathway. What I've tried to show in this uh, slide is a very, uh, almost like a very a simple form of this very complex pathway. The start of this pathway is at RAS, which is membrane bound. So it's always bound to the, the, the membrane. And it's inactive, usually it's inactive when it's bound to GDP. But when it gets phosphorylated to GTP, it gets activated and it starts that signal induction to the next step, RAF, and then MEC1 and 2, and finally ERK1 and 2, which then goes into the nucleus. It affects protein, it affects uh, uh, different genes to be transcribed, and also transcription factors which go on ahead um, and start another process of uh, gene transcription. So the ultimate goal of this pathway is for cell growth to happen, proliferation, cell survival and differentiation to happen. It also leads to the production of further growth factors, cytokines and cyclins. And you can see that it, this pathway with induces growth factors can also auto induce itself. So it can go into the cycle of auto induction which is important for cell growth. So the, the signal to start this pathway, which starts at RAS, actually comes from a, a ligand when it binds to the tyrosine kinase receptor. And we are all familiar with tyrosine kinase receptors, which are involved in a lot of endocrine functions and conditions. And it phos autophosphorates the receptor, dimerizes, and starts the molecular cascade which activates RAS and important molecules are GRB2 and SOS1 because they're also implicated. SOS1, for example, is implicated in Newton syndrome. You see this another uh, protein over here called SHIP2. That is also a, a regulator of signal induction of RAS. It modulates the, you know, if it wants to induce RAS, it can stimulate more RAS production and that is the, the main uh, gene which is involved. And Noonan syndrome is right here. So SHIP2 not only induces rat, RAS pathway, it is also involved in PI3 kinase uh, K or AKT pathway, which ultimately also leads to the same goal as the RAS pathway is doing with cell growth, uh, survival differentiation. Not shown over here, SHIP2 is also involved in JAKSTAT pathway as well, which we are very aware with the growth hormone signaling and in, in uh, inflammatory processes as well. So if you have an issue with any of these genes or proteins involved in this pathway, uh, that term is called resopathies. It was uh, diagnosed, it was, this term was coined recently uh, I, I believe it was two, 2007. Uh, this includes Noonan syndrome. It also includes uh, Noonan syndrome with multiple litigenous, which used to be called leopard syndrome, Noonan-like syndrome with loose antigen here, Costello syndrome, we're all familiar with that, seeing patients with that, cardiofacial cutaneous syndrome, also called CFC syndrome, uh, NF1 and NF1-like syndrome, which is also called Legis syndrome. So all these uh, mutations are found on this pathway and they're mostly activating mutations which called rasopathies. So in this slide I've put in just for illustration purposes how many genes for example are involved in Noonan syndrome which is NS over here on the left side and you can see Costello syndrome has only one gene which is uh, related with that which is HRAS you could have mutations in, for example, in a BRAF gene mutation, which can affect Noonan syndrome. It can also affect cardiofacial cutaneous syndrome. So hence, this is the basis of why there is so much phenotypic variability, not only just in Noonan syndrome, because there are so many genes involved, also in other resopathies. And you could have phenotypical variation with the same mutation, 
in the same family and uh, or across the syndromes if these genes are affected could present differently so that definitely uh, has challenge and that's why the clinical diagnosis of Dunan syndrome is so important so what are these various gene mutations which affect Noonan syndrome? And this is a very long discussion, but I'm trying to focus on how it affects growth, how these gene mutations affect growth and Noonan syndrome, because that's, as an endocrinologist, that's what we want to learn. Uh, so the first gene which was identified was a PTPN11 gene, uh, which basically stands for protein tyrosine phosphatase non-receptor 11 and it encodes for the ship 2 protein which is we've seen it in the previous slides but there is a, a little bit of a a bigger picture that how and where ship interacts with this pathway and it signal uh, uh, induces ras it enhances ras uh, signaling it leading to the changes the ultimate changes with cell growth, survival, differentiation, et cetera. So not only cell growth, it, a, a lot of growth factors are modulated by this ship protein, uh, which involve growth factors. Some of them we are aware of. We showed the, the TGF alpha, uh, the PDGF, EGF, and IGF1, um, and other cytokines, hormones like insulin, for example, which works through insulin receptor as also the ship has role in signal transduction, all these hormones. So PTPN11 mutation is found in about half, or 50% of uh, what has been described in Noonan syndrome. The phenotype with the PTPN11 is you get a severe short stature phenotype. With PTPN11, this is probably the phenotype that Dr. Noonan or most of us have seen and described. This is the one which is with pulmonic valve stenosis. You see less of the cardiomyopathy phenotype. With this, you see less of the ASD. With PTPN11, uh, you see more bleeding disorders, higher risk for leukemia with PTPN11. The second mo uh, com most common mutation gene mutation is the SOS1 and the SOS1 gene. And the phenotype is a little bit different in SOS1 with the PTV1-11. You get less of the short stature. And the later slides I'll show uh, what the height phenotype is with SOS1. You still get the pulmonic stenosis, uh, less of the ASD. And the, the intellectability has been preserved in this specific mutation. And some patients have even been reported with higher intelligence. Uh, there's a skin and hair phenotype to this syndrome listed here, but also is involved in the formation of giant cell lesions and some malignant tumors also been related to SOS1. RAF1 is another gene roughly around 10%, uh, seen in about 10%, and has a phenotype which is predominantly, the cardiac phenotype is predominantly of a cardiomyopathy one, which is hokum. And it's usually identified really early in infancy, early childhood. There's been cases reported of even fatality because of cardiomyopathy in the first year of life. And also the stature phenotype also tends to be severe in this uh, gene mutation. Uh, also associated with nevi, lentiginous, and cafe au lait spots. RIT1 mutation, also similar to the RAF mutation in terms of the cardiac phenotype. That means it has more about, about the same around 70% of cardiomyopathy phenotype, but tends to have a less severity for the stature and also low risk for intellectual issues with this syndrome. So predominantly more of a cardiac uh, phenotype for RIT1. SHOX2, SHOC2 uh, gene is also important uh, in Noonan syndrome. It's not that prevalent, somewhere around 5%, but 
but the height has been affected more severely and there's been a growth hormone uh, growth hormone deficiency phenotype associated with shocks too. Uh, another feature is that usually you see hyperactive behavior in kids with this and there is a skin and a hair phenotype. The skin especially is darkened and thickened skin so ichthyosis develops in the syndrome and the voice is a hoarse voice uh, so it's a little distinct, has some unique features uh, with Noonan's. And with the, as far as the cardiac phenotype is concerned, it does not involve the pulmonic valve or the, the myopathy. It's more of a mitral valve defect uh, sort of phenotype. Keras is uh, not a common gene which is mutated, but it does affect severe uh, intellectual disability and the height effect is a little bit less. So moving on to what you know really makes endocrinologists interested is the stature you know and uh, as we discussed that short stature is present in around 80 percent of these kids. Still the exact mechanism of short stature is not fully understood but it's been classified into three categories. There's been growth hormone deficiency which has been described in Noonan syndrome. In around 40%, there is neurosecretory dysfunction, which is described. And also uh, growth hormone resistance phenotype has been described, especially in the PTPN11 positive patients, because they tend to have low IGF-1, low ALS, and a normal IGF-BP3 levels. And we'll see how they respond to growth hormone therapy. Uh, it's very similar to growth hormone resistance. What is the normal growth pattern in Noonan syndrome? They really don't start off with being severely restricted at the time of the birth. Uh, there is uh, higher prematurity rates because of polyhydroamnias, but the height starts to drop off at the first year of life. And by prepubertal, majority of them are below the third percentile. And when puberty comes, they are like severely affected in the height to negative 2.5 standard deviations below. And part of the reason is puberty is delayed in Noonan syndrome. And that divergence starts to happen at age 11 and uh, for females and 12 for males. This is where the normal puberty is going on and the divergence of the growth chart starts to happen. What is interesting is the males don't really have a plateau. You don't see the flattening of the growth chart with males in Noonan syndrome and it's been reported that they can be growing even beyond 20 years of age because they don't have a growth flattening effect in males. So this growth chart is taken from the data which was originally presented by Witt in 1986. And the lines over here show how the mean and the standard deviation of Noonan syndrome, this one is for a boy, this one is for a girl, and the shaded part is the standard growth chart. You could see that in first year of life for both males and females, there is short stature, which is developing, which is slowly getting more pronounced in the pre-pubertal and certainly in the, pre, in the pubertal age group. Boys, you could see there is no flattening. This is still 18 years of age. There is no flattening of the growth, chart, uh, growth curve, which is happening. In girls, there is uh, some flattening, which is happening. Uh, this is how the, the, the natural progress of stature in Noonan syndrome is. Uh, this, uh, these slides are taken from a paper published in a Brazilian cohort uh, by Dr. Balakis. And the shaded green is your standard growth chart. The shaded blue is for boys, the height for boys. Shaded pink is height for girls. You could see very similar to what was published by Witt. And in over here, you can see this age, I'm not sure if uh, you guys can see clearly, but this was still about 20 years of age and still there is no uh, flattening of the growth chart, which is happening in boys. Girls do have a flattening of growth chart. Important thing to remember is BMI tends to be on the lower side and the BMI does not go up with puberty as it happens in other children and it stays flat in kids with Noonan syndrome. This is basically the same representation, uh, but individually it's plotted without the, the shaded standard charts. 
And so what is the final height uh, in terms of absolute numbers? So different studies have given a little bit different uh, data on the height, but the, the first study said males would be around 161 centimeters. Uh, this one uh, was from Europe, so that would be close to 5'3". Uh, subsequent studies have shown 162 for males, 167. The one study from UK females, uh, the final height ranges from 150 to 152 according to the European data. The Brazilian cohort uh, has given us different numbers, 157 centimeters on average for males, but and the Japanese also consistently giving us ethnic specific uh, numbers for adult height. But when you look at corrected for the population, you're looking at a, a negative 2.3 to negative 2.5 standard deviation for males and around a negative 2.2 or negative 2.3 for females across the globe. Uh, a little note over here that P2P and 11 mutations are even four centimeters less. So the most common reason behind Noonan syndrome is even less than these average adult heights. So that brings us into how does PTP and 11 affect so it seems like even at the time of birth, it, they do start off as on the lower side. Some studies have even shown that they're even negative two standard deviation for birth length. And they start to have severe short stature from the very young age, not only the, the frequency, but the severity of, of the short stature is also significant. And by six years of age, you can see a clear difference in the PTP N11 positive and the negative patients. Uh, we talked about having uh, them having some degree of growth hormone resistance, uh, which could be a reason behind poor growth as compared to some of the other genes involved. Uh, other studies have uh, shown about the same effect of the PTPN11 mutation that they are significantly shorter at birth as compared to the, the SOS1 and the KRAS. In SOS1, the height is less severely affected uh, than PTBN11. So basically showing the same data on PTBN11 from Japanese, that they are shorter uh, as compared to some of the other mutations which has been reported to be associated with Noonan syndrome. Um, going again to the, the Brazilian study, which was very eloquent in showing how these actually gene specific gene mutations follow when we try to compare them uh, against themselves. It, so it seems like this, the SOX2 mutation seems to fare the poorest as far as the height when you just compare Noonan syndrome patients. They are a negative uh, of 1.2 or a 1.3 standard deviation even below the Noonan syndrome uh, cohort. The SOS1 and the BRAF1 seems to fare well. They're taller of the cohort and it seems to be less affected. Uh, the height seems to be less affected than SOS1. They also had BMI data in which BRAF uh, had uh, not only a, a taller phenotype, also had a better BMI, if you're interested to know the BMI. But for height, it seems like SOC2 and RAF1 were the lowest, and SOS1 and BRAF1, BRAF uh, fared well for the height. So that brings us into a little bit of understanding of uh, growth hormone therapy and what to expect and what the experience has been. And then we'll go into different genes and how the, uh, the results have been. This is the table uh, that shows, it's a busy slide, but I'll take your attention uh, to the important points. Uh, of the last 20 years, data has been uh, uh, synthesized in this table. What you see is a relatively small number of patients which have been reported, especially uh, in the beginning of 2000s, uh, except for the study done by Romano, reported by Romano, which had 65 uh, uh, children with Noonan syndrome. What is striking, I think, is uh, we are aware of the male-female split, but the striking is the age of start of growth hormone therapy, it seems to be older, seems to be later from some of the experience that we have in clinical practice that we tend to start. For example, kids with Turner syndrome earlier and kids with growth hormone deficiency earlier, 
the the age of start of treatment was a little bit later, except for uh, the, this later study, the tamarin. But initial studies, the state uh, the the age is later. Um, what has happened to height is even though these uh, children were treated for multiple years, which is anywhere from on an average of six to seven years to even studies show nine years, the change in the height standard deviation, if you look at, for example, NURDAM over here, is still, still further away from the tanner, from the, from the, sorry, from the target height by a negative 2.2 standard deviations. So even treated for on average for six years, still not able to get to the, uh, the, the target height. Kirk, 2001, had children who were treated on average for five years, uh, had still a deficit, height deficit, compared to the target height of negative two standard deviations. Did had height gains of about uh, one standard deviation to 1.7 standard deviation over multiple years, but still not able, for most of these studies, not able to get close to the target height. Uh, if you look at in terms of growth velocity, uh, these studies have shown that the baseline growth velocity, for example, is around four in the range of over four centimeters. So if we had just added these patients up, this is an average of the means that we calculated, but it comes out to be around 4.6 centimeters on the baseline. First year growth velocity, as we know with all types of growth hormone therapy is going to be the best year. Uh, but you see a growth velocity of eight, eight and a half centimeters in the first year, which is much less than what we expect in growth hormone deficiency. Uh, and as the second year and the third year rolled in, you had lower and lower growth velocities of around six centimeters. Uh, so there was maybe some initial catch up, but uh, you would expect a very slow catch up with these growth velocities at about six centimeters per year. Uh, then if you look at the NCGS data, uh, which I've highlighted in red, the, the take home points is the main age of enrollment was 11, was older. They were treated for about five and a half years. And the, the change in the height standard deviation was a, a good 1.4 standard deviation, but was significantly less, for example, when compared with growth hormone deficiency kids, because in this data set, they had reported Noonan syndrome and Turner syndrome and growth hormone deficiency kids. So certainly less than that, but an improvement. And also this uh, paper gave us important data, how much to expect with about five or six years of treatment, you can expect a height gain of about 10 centimeters on average for a boy and around nine centimeters for a girl. The answer registry uh, 2012 paper, uh, mean age was a slightly less, around nine years. Uh, baseline height was around negative 2.5 standard deviation with around four years of treatment, there was an improvement to a negative 1.3 standard deviation in height. Um, and we have listed the growth hormone dosing, which was used was more in year four as compared to year one. And the study also reported that there's a negative correlation with the baseline age. So the older the children were, there was less change seen in the, the delta height STS um, so I think the, the theme is the same across the, about the age of the start of growth hormone treatment. Uh, this data is also taken from the same study, which shows that with the years of treatment, you see an improvement in the height standard deviation. This was the cross-sectional group, which started off 120, but had only 17 kids at year four, but they also had an observational group in which they followed these seven children and they all had improvement in the height standard deviation. And every year they accumulated their height standard deviation scores. Um, this one is a data which is taken from the same study represented over here just to show how the growth hormone dosing was used 
And as the years of treatment went by, you see higher growth hormone dosing, uh, which calculates to about uh, 59 micrograms per kilo per, per day. For some of us who use per week dosing, it's 0.4, but which started off as a 0.3, so relatively lower dosing in the beginning has been reported, uh, and a higher dosing in the end. So something to think about in clinical practice about the dosing uh, when we start these children on growth hormone. The Nordenet study, along with the ANSWER uh, registry, reported in 2015 around 30, a Noonan syndrome mix of prepubertal and pubertal, age group around eight years of age. And over here, not only they reported the height standard deviation as compared to the standard population, but also according to Noonan syndrome rankings growth charts. And there was an improvement in four years in both of them. And in, uh, it went from a negative 2.6 standard deviations to a negative uh, 1.4 standard deviations. So certainly growth hormone therapy over years has shown an improvement in hand stand, uh, height standard deviations. But what is the percentage of kids who are still below the negative two standard deviation, even after getting growth hormone therapy? or four years. And those were about 80% when the study was had started. But in the end of that uh, reporting period of four years, about 23% or one fourth were still below the negative two standard deviations, right? Which was a flip from the start of the therapy from baseline, uh, but still uh, it's around one fourth, which is not surprising in Turner syndrome is around the same number. This is just a, a review of all the, uh, what the registries have reported. Uh, just quickly, we were, uh, the NCGS data from the 1996. Uh, the theme is about the same, that the age of growth hormone start is around nine to 10, especially in the initial studies. Uh, there was a severe short stature. Uh, baseline growth velocity was around four centimeters. With multiple years of treatment, it did improve. But if you average it out, the growth velocity comes out to be around 5.7 centimeters a year, uh, in, given the initial increase in the growth spurt and the later slowdown. So it looks like multiple years of treatment will be required uh, to improve height standard deviations in these patients. Uh, what have we learned in the PTPN 11 positive mutation patients from the reported literature I've highlighted the data for the positive mutations in red, uh, two studies from 2005 by Binder and Ferreira reported that there was an improvement in height standard deviations in one year or three years of treatment, but it did not, it, uh, well, there was a difference between the mutation positive and the negative, and the ones who had the mutations did not do that well on growth hormone therapy, especially in Ferreira reported the growth hormone dosing was about the same they were treated for about three years. And you could see the difference in the change in the height standard deviations. And the growth velocity was lower at the first year and at the conclusion of the study. And similar 2006, Lemel had reported a similar difference in how the growth responses to growth hormone therapy on the PTPN and other mutations. The adverse effects to the growth hormone in Newton syndrome has to do with the cardiac phenotype especially the cardiomyopathy phenotype, and not so much with the, the pulmonary pulmonic valve stenosis. Overall, it's considered to be a safe uh, therapy to be used. There have been some reported, I've uh, mentioned those case reports or uh, the reports of increased cardiomyopathy, hypertrophy, sorry, and uh, in some cases, the growth hormone has been even stopped. Uh, cardiologist needs to be involved, we all know that. And these kids, especially with the cardiomyopathy, need to get echoes done every six months or six, uh, 12 months, depending on individual cases. But overall, it's considered to be a safe, safe therapy to be used, even in the presence of cardiomyopathy. Malignancy risk does exist, especially for some specific PTPN11 mutations. Uh, and a, a calculation showed that by around 55 year, years of age, that risk of malignancy is around 23%, which is around three and a half 
times greater than in the general population. So this is a good point, I think, which has to be discussed with families when starting growth hormone therapy to put it out there that there is an increased risk of malignancy. Uh, and also certain mutation cause uh, myeloproliferative disorders, some rare form of leukemia, JMML. Uh, these had been not only in PTBN11, but in CVL and KRAS mutations also. Uh, there's been a case report of RIT1 causing ALS before the age of five years. Solid tumors has also been reported with SOS1, for example, rhabdomyosarcoma, Sertoli cell tumors, and uh, PTBN11 with SOS and RAF1 cause have been implicated in a benign giant cell tumor growth. And uh, multi malignant schwannomas have also been reported in women syndrome. What is the guideline uh, according to our oncologist friends? Um, this is a publication from uh, clinical cancer research in 2017, in which there was some guideline for the risopathies. And as you could see, it's stratified according to the syndrome, according to the mutation. And the NS Newland syndrome, if you have specific mutations, then only there is a guidance to, for them to undergo surveillance, that, uh, especially if till they are five years of age, that CBCs needs to be done on a three monthly or six monthly basis, and a spleen exam needs to be done. Uh, same thing for the CVL mutations. But for otherwise, there is no increased surveillance which is recommended according to this publication if you don't have those high risk mutations in the PTBN11 uh, gene or if you don't have a CVL mutation. So, uh, our oncologists over here in, our, in my institution do recommend that we don't start. Um, growth hormone therapy till about five years if they have a KRAS or a specific PTN uh, N11 mutations. What are some of the other endocrine disorders which are associated? Uh, I would focus in the interest of time on cryptorchidism in males, which is about 70% and 60% and of the time is, has to be so shown to be bilateral. Uh, exact mechanism of cryptorchidism is not known, but has maybe some link with uh, local hormonal factors like INSL3 and some neurotransmitters which uh, perhaps work through the RAS uh, pathway, but it's not been proven. But with any cryptorchidism, there is an increased risk for Sertoli cell tumor, infertility. The current guideline is actually uh, that it orthopexies needs to be done between six to 12 months of age. Uh, there is also presence of micropenis, probably because of lower testosterone and testicular dysfunction, which has been reported. Fertility uh, and puberty, uh, if puberty is late, as we've discussed, on average, boys, their pubertal age is between 13 and a half to 14 and a half. Girls is from 13 to 14. It's delayed. There's been some reports that, that puberty had to be induced, but for most, it is a, a normal puberty it is a slow puberty, there is slow development of sex, uh, secondary sexual characters. And around 80% of males have described to have smaller testicular size, but eventually in adulthood, they do get to go to the normal testicular size. Uh, mostly the Lydex cell function has been described to be normal. Some reports of some subnormal Lydex cell function and lower testosterone, but uh, the Sertoli cell dysfunction is more commonly associated with Nunum, that has to do either with cryptarchidism, but it's also been reported in patients who did not have undescended testes. So there could be some local hormonal factors which are important uh, in sperm formation uh, because there's been reports of low spermatogenesis. High FSH levels have been reported cryptarchidism and uh, because of gonadal function and impaired androgen production as well. There has been reports of high uh, prevalence of autoimmune thyroid condition, for example, two to three fold. There's been autoantibodies that have been tested in higher numbers in Noonan syndrome. They also tend to have other antibodies, uh, ANA, anti uh, um, DSDNA antibodies, just in general, more autoimmune antibodies have been reported in NS. Uh, the clinical guideline is the same to test thyroid function uh, every 
three to five years in children and in adults. Um, but it seems like this autoimmune phenomenon is a little bit more common in the syndrome. As a nutshell, uh, endocrine issues evolve in Noonan syndrome. We discussed the growth in detail, thyroid increase in uh, incidence of uh, autoimmune thyroid conditions with some report of elevated TSH and low T4s. Testicular function seems to be compromised, especially in the presence of cryptorchidism and on top of that pubertal delay, uh, which has definitely an effect on Sertoli cell function uh, with low inhibin B and elevated FSH levels. The, the lytic cell function more or less is fine uh, some studies have shown the effects of HCG stimulation tests with some compromise in testosterone. That could be because of uh, long-standing cryptorchidism. Ovarian function is reported to be normal, except for the pubertal delays, which is also seen in females. And interestingly, as the bone phenotype has been described, that there is uh, decreased bone mineral density in Noonan syndrome, which could have something to do also with the RAS pathway. Pituitary function is more or less described to be normal. Glucose metabolism, you would think that it affects the tyrosine kinase pathway. Uh, even though they have normal or lower BMI, some studies, have, one study I would say has shown that they have some impaired glucose tolerance even in the face of normal BMI. So some effects on insulin signaling uh, can be expected. Uh, if we have time, I just wanted to highlight giant cell lesions, because this, this is the reason I got interested in Noonan syndrome, uh, because the appearance of giant cell lesions, uh, which can initially go unnoticed, these are rare and benign, uh, typically in, uh, involves the, the mandible and the maxillary area, and it can start at three to four years of age, but it can develop into adulthood, and uh, there is no guidance whether to do growth hormone therapy and uh, whether to proceed with the growth hormone or withhold growth hormone therapy. Uh, the, uh, and these conditions develop in Noonan syndrome. Uh, more commonly associated with PTPN11 mutation in SOS1, there's also a phenotype that Noonan syndrome is associated, and there is a giant cell lesion syn uh, syndrome also, uh, which has been named. Uh, it seems like there could be a second hit hypothesis, which is there that not only you have PTPN11 and SOS mutations, you have another factors which go off. Uh, and these kids lose their triangular face appearance and you can see the prominence of these lesions either unilaterally or bilaterally appear. And on histology, they look like multinucleated giant cells. Uh, to sum up my talk, I would say that Noonan syndrome, the clinic, it has the mainstay is clinical diagnosis, but has a very high phenotypic vari variability. So we still need a clinical skills to make the clinical diagnosis. Untreated uh, short stature leads to a big height deficit. Growth hormone therapy can add five or 10 centimeters according to the age. Uh, but so far treatment has been shown that it started later on. And these are exactly the, uh, the poor response elements that we're looking at late start of growth hormone therapy and usually relatively low dose of growth hormone, which is used in humans. And this is even further impaired in the most common mutation, the PTP111. Overall cancer risk is there, but it's low, uh, should be discussed with parents, but should not withhold growth hormone treatment unless you have specific mutations, which is still about five years of age, which need cancer surveillance and we discuss the Sertoli, presence of Sertoli cell dysfunction on top of pubertal delay and higher incidence of thyroid autoantibodies in Noonan syndrome. Uh, I think that will conclude my, my talk. And if somebody has questions, I will, I will take in the Q&A. And if we are not able to address, please email it to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bangu. That was very, very interesting and a very good you know, summary of, of a very broad topic in terms of endocrine care. Um, so we're queuing up for questions here. So very quickly for people, we have about nine 
questions already queued up and we'll try to get to them. Some of them are things that you've already covered. Uh, but for those of you who are not on like a desktop or laptop environment, um, you can send chat like if you're on a tablet and we'll try to get to your questions as we can here. Um, also, please visit the virtual exhibit hall afterwards and um, thank our sponsors who made this possible. And also, if you've enjoyed this webinar, and are interested in some of the other webinars that we have, please visit um, hgffound.org website. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, try to pull up the questions here. A number of them, and I'll just go ahead and try to lump these together, dealt with cancer risk, which I think you um, did an excellent job on, on covering. But again, do you have anything that you would add in terms of just your own personal practice experience um, yep. as well? Um, also, if you can close your PowerPoint too, that'll be helpful as far as freeing up space. Okay. Uh, should I stop the share? Um, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, to that point, I think what, um, with the cancer risk, what I think we need to understand is the RAS pathway is really important in cancer development. And there's a lot of research going on in RAS pathway. Around 20% of somatic mutations, 20% of all cancers have somatic mutations which deal with RAS pathway. So the number is huge. But in Noonan syndrome, we have germ-like mutations in the RAS pathway. And the numbers does not seem like it's that high, close to 20%, which is reported in somatic mutations. So that's a good you know, comfort point that we can take from this. Uh, certainly there is increase in some malignancies that we just, just discussed, especially JM, JMML, some solid tumors, but this seems to be with specific PTPN11 mutations. And we get an oncology consult exactly you know, right away if there's a KRAS mutation or a specific mutation with the PTBN11. And they are very good in following these kids for surveillance. And we don't feel comfortable treating them till they're about age five. Hmm. Um, with SAUS1, their growth phenotype is not as severe. So sometimes that's okay to just follow them. With PTBN11, you, sometimes you do get into that challenge, hmm. but uh, whether to treat or not less than five years of age. But you, really, the surveillance is still about five years of age. Do you find, from your standpoint, that there are any situations where um, you would um, consider not doing? You know, obviously, if there's active malignancy, but where you would consider not using growth hormone as promptly, since it does seem that earlier initiation of growth hormone helps, and that's certainly, from my standpoint, been my um, experience. And then the other question kind of as a follow on again, talking about oncology is, do you um, really take care to involve the oncologist in the follow up of the patient if, they are, if they're not already engaged with an oncologist? Um, so I would say not all NS patients are referred to oncology only if they have a high risk mutation. Hmm. They are, uh, so something that we have to think about as a society, that's something we have to do or not. Uh, but uh, no, not every patient has been seen by oncologist, but the ones who start off, are, they do get followed by oncologist. Uh, I do tend to get a clearance before starting growth hormone therapy on them also, even after five years of age. Uh, and I, I don't believe there's a follow up after we start growth hormone therapy with oncologist because they go by the surveillance guidelines, which is still about five years of age. So I think that's really interesting as a society. Uh, maybe at some forum, we need to dig deep into the cancer risk with Noonan syndrome because it does have an official uh, approval for use of growth hormone therapy, in, at least in the U.S. And, right. You know, uh, what obligation we have towards our patients in the long term. I think that's probably, again, the benefit of having, you know, long-term longitudinal data that's collected on patients, kind of like the, the registry studies have done. And hopefully we can still have something like that. Um, a, another question had to do with uh, the maternal versus paternal uh, 
transmission of the mutation of PTP N11. Have you seen any differential effect on whether on the phenotype or other factors, or are you aware of any, you know, depending on whether this is paternally or maternally derived? Uh, I'm personally not aware of, but if somebody has uh, an experience, I would uh, be happy to learn from okay. them. So I haven't seen, and I was also surprised to see that there is a predominant maternal uh, transmission. Um, that's interesting. Okay. Um, what about, and, and again, you'd highlighted this in your talk about the, the genetics in terms of responsiveness of growth hormones. So one of the participants asked if you use uh, differing doses of growth hormone in the patients depending upon their mutation. Uh, yes, uh, to start with the Noonan syndrome, I tend to use higher dosing. And uh, generally I go up very quickly. Very quickly means within three mm. to six months to look at their growth response and uh, the IGF-1 levels mm. uh, to get a, a, I would like to see a catch-up growth is exactly what I'm looking for is the catch-up growth, mm -hmm. change in their height standard deviations. So personally, I do change the dosing uh, very quickly, which is over three to six months after starting growth hormone therapy. I see. Okay. So what this, about, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. You were going to say. I was just going to say that from the, the, the answer registry, you saw how by year four, you know, eventually people were using higher dosing, you know, so maybe the thing, you know, everybody's different, but the thinking should be maybe to start with higher dosing in the beginning, as long as it's safe with their IGF-1 levels. Uh, and rather than using lower dosing from the beginning. I think that certainly makes sense to me. And, and that actually brings up a very good question for me personally. Just, I'd be interested in, in your experience and recommendations. So with obviously the increased predisposition for cancer, do you watch the IGF ones more carefully and do you have a particular threshold or Z score, Z score where you say, eh, I, I don't want to go beyond that? Um, Joel, excellent point. I think I'm still going with the positive two standard deviation. Okay. So if one, uh, again, you know, should be using a positive 1.5 standard deviation. Uh, one thing we have to remember is the PTP and N11, uh, they have deficiency of IGF-1 production. So even after we're using higher dosing, you don't see that high IGF-1 level production going on in PTP and N11. So that's a little bit of a safety that you would say. Okay. Um, and then I, there were several questions too, just to sort of roll these into addressing those questions about the cryptorchidism and about delayed puberty and about fertility. Um, can you um, share some insights in terms of um, you know, cryptorchidism where you have some role in terms of management from a, or surveillance from an endocrine standpoint and a little bit about your experiences on fertility or how you counsel families um, things such as that. Yeah. So fertility, you know, unfortunately in pediatrics, we don't have many tools that we can deal with infertility issues in boys at such a young age, uh, especially less than 18 years of age. And the reason for cryptorchidism is also not known in Noonan syndrome. The theory is there could be some local hormonal factors which are either in the around the Sertoli cells in in the gonads which are responsible for the descent of the testes but it's not fully known why cryptorchidism happens hmm. and even in the kids who did not have undescended testes they still had some element of Sertoli cell failure with elevated fsh levels and low nfn b so the fact that the, the testes were descended, even then, there is some element of Sertoli cell failure. So that makes me make me think about something going at the intracellular level or in the paracrine level, not in the endocrine level. And something that has to do with the RAS pathway sub growth hormone. Uh, from the, the literature, puberty was not, did not have to be induced. It happened naturally. It was mm. slow. And when you're treating somebody with growth hormone, you'd rather not give them testosterone. Correct. To close their bone age. 
And there is another advantage in Noonan syndrome, I think, is with boys not having this flattening of the growth curve, we can treat a little bit longer uh, because there is a little bit more time towards the end that we can treat. Uh, so I think there's some benefit of not treating. Uh, but counseling for infertility uh, definitely should be done. Sperm counts are now available in labs like Quest and the patients can walk in and get the sperm count done if they're interested, even if they're less than 18 years of age. Uh, Is that something that you, um, it, as part of your practice, try to do in a, a very deliberate fashion or you do you do it on more of a case-by-case -case basis? Uh, I try to, for example, with Kleinfelter's kids, no. I try to talk with them at around 15 years of age. Absolutely, uh, yes. Yeah, that they, they need to go at least, if they're interested in, get a semen sample done. So we know what the baseline is. There is no guideline for Noonan syndrome, but it's done on an individual basis. Okay. Uh, do you use any particular parameters to one of the, the panel, the people participating asked about um, whether if there's abnormal gonadotropins, do you refer them uh, sooner for fertility consults? Uh, yeah, we see more frequently elevated FSH levels. Uh, I don't go by an elevated FSH per se. I think mostly okay. in my practice, I'm mostly focused with their growth. Um, we don't have a pediatric reproductive specialist in males, mm. and the adult urologists tend not to see them till 18. So when they're done after 18 is the only time we refer them out. Okay, very good. Um, what about, uh, there? this also was a question I had, and there are several questions relating to the, the skeletal uh, manifestation. So um, one of the questions deals with, you know, whether kind of in the, the same uh, situations like Turner syndrome, there's uh, somewhat of a skeletal dysplasia phenotype. And then you had mentioned too about the, the low bone density. I'm curious, do you see any type of increased risk in fracture? We haven't, uh, I haven't seen any literature on fracture I might be missing, but poor bone density has been uh, reported. Hmm. Uh, also, it's been reported in the kids who had these giant cell lesions. So mm -hmm. it's interesting. It seems like there is down the path from uh, the ship protein, either a second hit happens or there's some other factor, which is important for bone growth. Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely seen in those patients with the giant cell lesions, the PTBN11, SOS1 mm -hmm. mutations. And PTBN11 is the most predominant. So um, Again, I think it's one of the things where we, we have not enough data on it. I see. Um, there are two questions really sort of um, touching on things that are, I would say, outside of the what are FDA approved indications, but um, just comment on these. One is about IGF-1, since you had mentioned about growth hormone resistance, so the, the possibility of using recombinant IGF-1. Um, and then the other one had to do um, uh, presumably, the, the uh, questioner is asking about the potential use for like an aromatase inhibitor to extend the growth window further, especially if you have extreme short stature, kind of as an adjunct to growth hormone. Yes. So the first, I think what I can remember is there was a trial of combination of IGF-1 and IGF-BP3 around 15 years ago, and I think it was discontinued mm. after the, the company was closed down. Um, I think that's the one that I can remember. I'm not sure if there's been individual experiences with use of IGF-1. Uh, yeah. Again, you have to remember it was going to go through the tyrosine kinase receptor, and uh, you might have even some issues with signal transduction with IGF-1. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the bone phenotype is concerned, I think knowing now, I tend not to treat them with aromatase inhibitors because I know their bone age is going to go slowly in puberty. Uh, and with the bone phenotype, uh, why increase that risk for a poor bone density to go forward? And at the same note, I'm not sure if we can use the same bone age standards that is mentioned in Grulick and Pyle with the tables that we have available to predict mm -hmm. the height because they are not following the normal pubertal Growth, they don't go through a growth spurt. There is no growth spurt. It's just extended puberty, which happens. So I think even to calculate predicted heights, I'm not sure if we're going to get a better, 
a good number, an accurate number, even based on the predicted heights that we're getting by using Grolich and Pyle. I see. Um, one uh, questioner asks about uh, baseline MRI scans. I mean, before you initiate growth hormone, do you do that? MRI scans, no. Okay. Uh, do not do. I wouldn't think so, but I um, wanted to give that uh, person a chance. Um, what about, um, there are several questions about, again, cardiac surveillance. So again, this is something obviously working hand in hand with the cardiologist. Right. So the, question, the two questions really deal with both, do you get baseline cardiac imaging beforehand? Um, and how frequently do you feel like, or do you recommend that they get cardiac follow-up and imaging? Yeah, so if there was a child who was diagnosed with cardiomyopathy and they're in good care, they should get annual echoes done until three years of age. Mm -hmm. This is, we're not talking about their own being on growth hormone or not. This is just a, a kid who has cardio, uh, sorry, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So their recommendation is to do annual echoes on them till three years of age hmm. at, at five and then at 10. Uh, I would recommend, strongly recommend doing a baseline echo on all of the uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy kits that you're treating. And I would say even for the ones with pulmonic valve stenosis, although the risk is not that much for them, it's mostly to do with the, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy ones. Um, and our cardiologist, it's, it's again, the, I think the guideline is that it's case to case basis. And I've usually seen intervals uh, Q6 or Q month, uh, 12 months that mm -hmm. they're doing the echoes on. Okay. And this, they stop to follow them once growth hormone therapy is done. Okay. And uh, a very good question just came in. So obviously, when we, the, the primary or pro, typically the primary reason that we're treating um, most of our patients with growth hormone is for growth issues to help with height improvement or normalizing growth velocity. In the case of Noonan syndrome, are there any other endpoints that growth hormone is shown to be beneficial on besides just helping with height and helping to avoid, you know, the, the challenges that one can uh, experience when they're at the extremes in terms of short stature? I think it's a really good question. We know that Noonan syndrome has a neurological phenotype as well, uh, especially with attention uh, deficit, hmm. uh, with uh, lower, some mutations as we discussed with lower intellectual abilities and some tone, muscle tone issues. Um, I don't want to quote if there's been any studies with improvement, but certainly if there is a, a a muscle mass or a muscle tone issue that can improve with growth hormone therapy, perhaps the bone phenotype can improve. But I don't want to quote, I'm not sure if there's been studies done just on the mm. non growth part of Newton syndrome. And I would think too, since you know you had quoted and, and, and we know that there is some degree of growth hormone deficiency that we can demonstrate at least on, on testing, right. uh, one would wonder whether there might be some of the, the the metabolic effects that you could see, you know, if you had a more severe growth hormone deficient phenotype. Right, but they, they tend to have a lower BMI. And mm -hmm. interestingly, the BMI does not go up with pre, in the prepubertal and the pubertal age as it with the other kids. So, but there is also a report of insulin resistance. Or it, I would say impaired glucose tolerance, not insulin resistance, but impaired glucose tolerance in these kids. And, um, and that actually is a good point. I'm just looking here through our questions. I think we've hopefully covered most of the questions. I do have one question though, in regards to that point. So with that in mind, with, with insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, is there anything in particular that you do to, to screen for that? Again, knowing that you have a, a more normal BMI in these individuals. I think I tend to do a hemoglobin A1C at least once a year. Uh, on, for example, Turner syndrome, uh, Noonan syndrome, especially when they go through puberty. Hmm. And for other of the, the heavier kids that I treat with growth hormone also for other indications. Um, but uh, Noonan's has been reported to be a little bit favorable phenotype because of their lower BMI. They tend to be skinny. Hmm. Uh, but again, 
uh, I think they could develop transient impaired glucose uh, intolerance during puberty, especially during puberty. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I think I, I've gotten the, the, the cue that we need to wrap up. So thank you so much again. This is a very, very informative uh, presentation. So thank you for taking time out of your schedule to, to present such a, a wonderful webinar for us. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Take care.